short remarks. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to open up with a few comments and then give you guys most of the time. But it's just absolutely fantastic to be here with you. I will tell you three points. Um, the first is to join this team down at Fort Benning in the Maneuver Center of Excellence. It's just a, it's a great honor for both my wife and I to join this team because Fort Benning, as you guys know, just as well, has got a great history and a great legacy of training soldiers for the Army and defense of the nation. It all goes back here to, since 1918, as you know. And so to join that legacy is just a, it's a great honor. The second thing is um, I will tell you that the reputation of this community and the relationship that Columbus and the larger Georgia community has with Fort Benning is well known. And that, that, uh, that legacy extends well beyond the state of Georgia. I, I just came from a job at the Pentagon. I can't tell you the number of people that came to talk about the relationship that Columbus has with Fort Benning. And so we're just glad to be joining members of this community. We intend to participate greatly in the, in the Columbus activities, and so we really look forward to that. And the third thing I wanted to share with you is we, um, we just wish uh, General Miller a fond farewell. I wish him nothing but the, the best. You know him as well as I do, I'm sure, and he is a gracious gentleman. And he has opened his arms to me, and we wish him luck, but he's just done a great job of being a steward of Fort Benning, Georgia. So with that, I'd open it up to some questions. Sir, when you found out you were coming to the Maneuver Center of Excellence, what went through your mind? Oh, it was, well, I told you, it's, it's a great honor. But let me tell you, my, uh, my baptism into the Army started at Fort Benning, Georgia, like many young lieutenants that came here for Ranger School. So it was always the standard bearer, you know, as I was coming into the Army. It reflected being a soldier, because this is where I, I came to Ranger School. Um, but the other thing, on a larger perspective, is you, you have to remember that Fort Benning is the maneuver center of excellence, really drives the nature of how we fight, because we develop our doctrine here, we develop our combat platforms here, and so the opportunity to participate with our leadership in shaping the future of the Army was really what struck me, and so really looking forward to that. Um, when you're coming in as the fourth, fifth general to command the Maneuver Center, and all of them have brought a little something different from General Brown, General Farragher, General McMaster and recently General Miller. What do you bring that adds to that mix as of leading the Maneuver Center as Fort Benning has become a broader post from that perspective? Yeah, Chuck, great question. And so I've given this a lot of thought, and, and not just since coming to Fort Benning, but it's something that's been on my mind for a number of years. I think a lot of people would tell you, and, and I'm one of those, that uh, right now we are in a, uh, a juncture. We are at uh, a place you might call the interwar years. And when you, because history tells us there will be another war. Precedent tells us that. And if we're in that window of time that is the interwar years, this is a window to prepare for that, ne that next conflict. And so my sense is that the, the role, of, that my role that I can play, that I can contribute to, is to assist us in thinking deep and thinking far so that we are prepared for the next conflict. Whether that means combat platforms, um, continuing to refine that doctrine that's relevant to today's battlefield, um, those kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, what would you say is, uh, has been your biggest takeaway from your interactions with General Miller this week? General Miller is, like I told you, he is, he is one of the finest gentlemen I know in the Army. Um, he has a, not only a fine gentleman, but he's also a renowned war hero. He is a true warrior, and he has served in all of the conflicts in the last 20 years, 30 years. Um, I have great respect for him. He's been a mentor of mine. Um, got to know him about four or five years ago in Kabul, uh, in, in Afghanistan. And he's just been a great mentor of mine. So I've got big shoes to fill with him. He's renowned for uh, understanding tactics and fundamentals, and he has trained soldiers here, and he's lifted the, the bar to a new level. A lot of changes here at, at Fort Benning in the last year, um, the shifting around of 3rd Brigade, um, the different roles opening up to women. What changes are you bracing for as you enter enter this position? Well, there's none that I'm bracing for because that would that would imply I'm under assault. Um, but what, what I'm really looking forward to is the things I've already mentioned. Um, we do have a, a challenge facing us coming in the next several months, and that's gender integration. I think you referred to that. Um, my sense of that, as I, I will get into the details of the preparations that General Miller has led on, 
and continue to study that. But it, it, based on my perspective of what I've seen to date, that is going to make us better. And so what the Army is doing is looking to more clearly define what the standards are for and, and that, that are, pertain uniquely to each MOS in the military. And we will be able to recruit from a broader pool of people in order to ensure that all those military occupational specialties have the best people in them. So we'll work through the details of that, but I'm excited about what that will bring for us because I think it's going to make us better. Uh, it's Mercer from WRBL. Yes, um, your goals, what do you want to accomplish? I know you kind of mentioned a couple things, but what are your goals? Well, I think, I think that what I, which I mentioned is, is the goal. What, if, we are, if we are in a window in time, when we do not have, a, we do have conflicts around the world, we still have Iraq, we still have Afghanistan, and we're continuing to fight counterinsurgency fight and counterterrorism fight in those, in those areas. But truly, in terms of war, we are in an interwar period, and the goal right now is to take this window of time, exploit it to the degree possible so that we can prepare for the future. Readiness is our number one goal, as, as the Chief Staff of the Army has indicated. We have a role in preparing soldiers for current readiness, but we also have a role in looking deep. And so we have to ensure that we accommodate the requirements associated with future platforms and future doctrine. Since you're back at Fort Benning and you actually began here, what do you think that means for other men and women who may look up to you as a role model? I mean, you're making things possible for them. Talk a little bit about um, you, know, you as a leader, what that means for those people who are looking to fill that type of position eventually being so young and impressionable. You know, one of my mentors uh, years ago, when I was a captain, uh, he at the time was my battalion commander, and he said to me one time, he said, Eric, you are my opus. And he illustrated to me what mentoring, by that word, what mentoring means. Because mentoring is one of those things that lasts a lifetime. And, and leadership is mentoring because it's about reaching into the heart and soul of people that you work for and lifting them by virtue of your relationship with them to a level that they otherwise wouldn't have achieved. And so I, I re maintain relationships with those that I've worked with in the past. All of us are flawed, but my heart is, is that those relationships can continue to be sustained. And one of the things my father-in-law shared with me when I was a lieutenant colonel, he says, the, the more senior you go, the more you need to consider leveraging the capital you've built by virtue of your reputation in, in your rank on behalf of those you lead. And whether that's uh, investing that capital in the institution, investing in individual people, to lift them to new levels, that becomes what leadership is. Well, this is an opportunity, becoming a commander at Fort Benning, is it gives me greater opportunity to enable people who I work with to become those who they might otherwise not have been. Um, sir, what can the Maneuvering Center of Excellence team expect from you during your time here? I'm sorry, say the question again. What can the Maneuver Center of Excellence team expect from you during your time here? Well, I think I've, I've talked a little bit about that. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the future. Um, I think leadership is, a, is an area where you see me spending a lot of time. That means mentoring, reaching out to the students, and having an opportunity to have a dialogue. Um, as, a, as a leader, I tend to be relational. That is interaction with people, uh, frequent interaction with people, and sharing ideas, and exposing and making myself available to those people so that I can have an interactive relationship with them. General, one of the things you notice when you start Googling you um, is that your wife comes up a good bit in your Googles as part of the team, your military team. What role will your wife play in your in your tenure here at Fort Benning? Well, first is, I hope you get to meet her soon. She's a lovely woman, and uh, we are a team, in fact. Why is that? You know, first of all, there's a couple points here. Um, the Army is a family business. And anybody knows anything about the Army, it's a family business. Um, and although you ha will have a, a soldier in the family who raises their hand and makes a commitment, ultimately the whole family serves in some manner or the other. So my wife and I have always felt, uh, secondly, I'd say, um, felt called to this role. You know, I don't think we are driven so much as called. And, and so that is a, a freeing opportunity. It also re relieves a little bit of pressure because it's something that we do together. And uh, we, it's a cooperative nature. And uh, 
she would say some, probably some of the same things that I've mentioned. She enjoys building relationship with those we work alongside and creating teams with those that we work with. Because ultimately, the reason I, I mentioned this family issue is we become dependent on one another as an institution, as a family. Different soldiers will deploy at different times, but the entire family reaches out and mutually supports one another. And that's why there's that mutual role. Can I ask one more? Of course. Um, Thanks. Uh, there's a little bit of angst in the community with the loss of the 3rd Brigade here and the downsizing and st stuff. And there was recently General Anderson came in from the Pentagon and briefed uh, on troop structure here to about 75 or 100 community leaders. In that briefing, they kind of outlined the deficiencies that came up in the mission value, military value analysis. From your perspective, is that some, is troop reduction something the business community and the chamber community in, this, in Columbus needs to be greatly concerned on and paying attention to? Yes, always. Yes. Because there, you can't separate the community from the Army. We are not mutually exclusive from one another. There have been times when we have attempted that and we've failed. Um, we are mutually dependent on one another. So that's, that's just a fact. Um, secondly, the, what the business community, the Chamber of Commerce experienced based on the total Army analysis and the reductions in the 3rd Brigade is one of the reasons we, we need to maintain that relationship. So we can, we can work together to communicate to our senior leadership what is at play. Um, third point, and I would, I would argue that all of the, the community leaders need to keep this in mind, is this is not uh, an Army decision that is based on a... Um, an independent desire to remove 3rd Brigade. But all of this ultimately goes back to certain constraints that we're under, the BCA, um, sequester as it's known. And that's really the source of the issue. As long as we have the budget constraints that we do by virtue of that legislation, the Army will, it will be incumbent on them to make these kinds of decisions. Now, you, I think when you were there, Chuck, or based on your research, you've heard that we established as an Army a number of metrics to see how we would, we would optimize. And all of the installations across the United States participated in, in, in competing across those metrics. And then the Army does their analysis, and that was the conclusion. Now, we, we may di agree or disagree with the Army's decision, but that's a decision that they've made, and we've got to move forward. The best way to get after this, though, is to consider the impacts of the BCA and not ultimately the decision that the Army had to make in that environment. Thank you, sir. And we have time for <clears throat> one more question. I, I'd like to ask you, with the presidential election coming up and there's so much unrest, is that affecting what you're planning to do? Is that going to affect anything? No. Does that concern you? No, it doesn't. You know, we, we've got a long history, uh, democratic history, and these, these issues work themselves out. Um, what our role is has nothing to do with the election. Our role has to do with preparing to defend the nation and training soldiers to do so, and we continue to do that. We're good. Thank you. Listen, this is, this is fantastic. I look forward to actually sitting down and having a more interactive discussion with you, but um, it's really good to be here, and thanks for taking time to come out this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.